Now look guys, I don't know where you are at this morning, right? Because I haven't seen you for a while, we've been away on holidays. You may, might have been away on holidays, you might have gone through stuff that I didn't know about, I might have gone through stuff that you didn't know about. Not too sure where you are this morning. But what I do know is that all of us are at the 9th of January, a new year. And I can imagine, just the mere fact that it is a new year, and that we are at the start of the new year, brings forth thoughts of new stuff, right? New rhythms, new hobbies, new works, or new, new goals at work. Um, it might be new rhythms and things that you want to do. It might even be a new house, it might be a new job, it might be a whole bunch of new stuff. New Year brings forth thoughts and imaginations about stuff that can be new and that can be different. I mean, all of us had a time of reflection now. It might not have been as long, uh, but all of us have had a time of reflection. What happened last year? What did I learn? What do we need to change? What do we need to set our eyes on? What do we need to focus on? I mean, even for us, just as a household, we have a child in grade one this year, which means two different schools, which means a uh, different rhythm of getting up in the morning, which means a different rhythm of extramural activities, which means a different budget of things that we have to do, which means a different uh, involvement in the lives of our kids and in the school, which means, which means, which means, I mean, that's only one child going to grade one in Dorenkloof on Wednesday. I mean, with that comes this knock-on effect of reimagining stuff, making new decisions, and implementing new rhythms. Now, the start of the year is a good time for us to stop, and to think, and to pray before we get going with everyday life. It is a unique window, it's a unique opportunity we have to say, instead of just flying into this year and winging it or making it up as I go, let me just stop. Let me stop. Let me think. And as I think, let me pray. And after I've prayed, let's go. So this new series that I'm kicking off this morning will explore four themes from the Psalms that will compel us to stop, think, and pray, and then go. So these truths that we learn from the Psalms, guys, I believe it's stuff that we can build our daily lives on. It's stuff that will be able to sustain us, whatever this year might bring, because we are only at the 9th of January. It's truths that are meant to be something that we can recall at the start of each day. It's truths that we should be able to live from. It's truths, for me personally, that's a breath of fresh air. It should help us to feel revitalized and inspired and refreshed, full of life and vitality at the beginning of this year. It's way more than just hashtag new year, new me. It's way more than a new diet or new training regime or new rhythm. It's stuff that you can draw from every single day. It's stuff that you can build your life on, actually. And I want to leave us with these four things over the next four weeks so that we really have a solid foundation to build on as this year progresses. One of the questions that I think we need to ask in the beginning of the year, taking into account what might lie ahead for us, is also what does the Lord mean to us in times of disappointment, in times of pain, in times of loneliness, in times of illness, in times of anxiety, in times of fear, in times of temptation, and in times of doubt. Like if I would ask you now, just think back about 2021. When did you have disappointment, pain, loneliness, illness, anxiety, fear, temptation, and doubt? None of us will be able to say, I experienced none of those. I had a paradise and perfect year. Ta. Thank you very much. None of us had a perfect year last year. And I can guarantee you that none of us will have a perfect year this year. Because everything has not been made new. We do see God's kingdom waking through, absolutely. We do have His presence with us, absolutely. We are in power by Spirit, absolutely. There is good news for us every day, absolutely. While we live in this broken world. And a good question to ask yourself before we head into this year is, what does the Lord mean to me in times like this? And that's why we need to stop and think back about where we did experience these things and how we experience the presence of the Lord in it. Okay, back to the song. Here's what the psalm says. I'm just going to throw up a slide for you. I know it's really boring. It's bullets. It's for the left brain folk. Please forgive me. But here's what the psalm says. I want you to have a grip on the psalm. This is a psalm of trust. Every single psalm has a type or has a genre. Right? Some of it is praise, some of it is praise. Some of it is lament, some of it is historical. Some of it is meant to be sung as a song. This is a prayer of trust. It's a psalm that is meant to help us 
to put our trust in God. And here's what it says. It speaks about God's loving care. And it's illustrated to us by two images. God is a shepherd and God is a host. First four verses, God is a shepherd. And the last two verses, God is a host. This is, so this is what we are invited into. Put your trust in God, the shepherd and the host. And this is the structure of the psalm. I put a fancy schmancy word in brackets there, chiastic. It means that it's arranged in the form of an X. So we start with something, we finish with something, and there's crossover in the middle. So it starts with a confession. It starts with a witness. It starts with a statement that says, this is how it is. And then it has a prayer of trust. Therefore, I will trust. And then it has another prayer of trust. And then it is the reason why I'm trusting. And that is a confession and a witness again. Do you guys see it? Remember, this is a poem, guys, and we need to study it like a poem. So it's a poem that kicks off with a grand statement and it ends off with a grand statement. And in between it tells you why I believe in this and then it reaffirms my belief in it. Okay? So there we go. That is what the psalm says. Now, God is frequently represented or described or characterized as the shepherd of his people. If I just give you a couple of text uh, references, in Psalm 80 we find it, in Isaiah 40, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 63, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, Psalm 74, Psalm 79, Hosea 4, etc. So many times in the Old Testament, God gets represented as the shepherd of His people. Grand scale, big God, big people, big mission, big history. What I want you to see as we read this song and as we go through it is that there's the personal pronoun my in this song. Do you guys see it? I mean, I love the whole well, we not me vibe of the church, right? It's not about me, it's always about us, it's always part of the body. But sometimes, guys, when we get to scriptures and we stumble upon the word my, we really have to stop and think about this. Because not only is God our shepherd, God is my shepherd. It is a very personal, very individual statement that we need to take really seriously. Because if you say and confess and witness and pray that God is your shepherd, it means that you know Him. It means that you have a relationship with Him. It means that there's substance to the words of the confession that He is your shepherd, that He is my shepherd. And that's really crucial for this song. And then what you'll see is, so He's my shepherd, and I make my own personal confession that says, I have what I need. And then the song describes, in a very personal, first person and second person way, how He is a shepherd, in verses 2 to 4. And also how he is a host and how he gives me what I need in verses 5 to 6. Okay? So he doesn't speak about God in the third person or himself in the third person. He speaks about myself and God. I and he. He and I. It's a personal experience that the psalmist or the psalter or the writer of the psalm speaks about and writes about. So what a lot one can say about six verses. Right? Eh? I mean, this is only introductory remarks. But I want you to think of the psalm as Zita read it. I want you to take into account what we are dealing with here. And I want you to pay attention to the very personal nature of the psalm. And then we will look at what the psalm means. Are you guys good? Are you still tracking? Okay. Now let's look at what the psalm means. Now, every psalm has a type. I just said that. And every psalm also has a situation in which it was written. Like, someone had to sit down and actually write it, and copy it, and distribute it, and people had to receive it, and they had to start reading it, and they had to know where it came from. So anything that was written in human history was always written in a specific context, in a specific moment. And one of the coolest things we can do about the Bible is when we study a portion of Scripture, is to try and figure out who wrote this. And who did they write it to? And where were they when they wrote this? Right? Think about a psalm about God's beautiful creation. If I would ask you now, write me one. 
you probably have a place where you need to go to the Drakensberg, or the beach, or the bush felt, or somewhere where God's creation really speaks to you. And then you start writing the song and writing the song. In exactly the same way, the song came into the beginning. Now, it is difficult to determine when the song was written. It's also difficult to determine when the song was written in its final form. And it's also difficult to determine when the song started uh, being used by the people of God, being prayed and being recited. One of the theories, and I think it's a theory that will help us to at least understand where these words and these metaphors come from, is that this was written by David. The heading says a song of David, so I think we have it on good authority. And that this was written by David in a time when uh, he was fleeing from Saul. We read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 15 to 19. Right? And I'm going to read it for us. It's not on the slide, but it's story time. And, and because I think when we read this and then we look at the song, we go, my word, this is really, really compelling stuff. So listen to this. A story from the Old Testament. David was in the wilderness of Ziph. I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15. Now. David was in the, wilderness, in the wilderness of Ziph in Horish when he saw that Saul had come out to take his life. Then Saul's son, Jonathan, came to David in Horish and encouraged him in his faith in God, saying, don't be afraid. For my father Saul will never lay a hand on you. You yourself will be king over Israel, and I'll be your second in command. Even my father Saul knows it is true. Then the two of them made a covenant in the Lord's presence, and afterwards David remained in Horesh while Jonathan went home. So the Zephites came up to Saul at Gibeah and said, David is hiding among us in the strongholds of Horesh on the hill of Akila, south of Jeshimon. I'll show you photos of all of this now. Now, whenever the king wants to come down, let him come down. Our part will be to hand him over to the king. May you be blessed by the Lord, replied Saul, for you have shown concern for me. Go and check again. Investigate where he goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is extremely cunning. Investigate all the places where he hides. Then come back to me with accurate information and I'll go with you. If it turns out he really is in the region, I'll search for him among all the clans of Judah. So they went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness near Maon in the Arabah, south of Jeshimon, and Saul and his men went to look for him. When David was told about it, he went down the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. Saul heard of this and pursued David there. Saul went along one side of the mountain, and David and his men went along the other side. I'll show you the mountain now. Even though David was hurrying to get away from Saul, Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them. Then a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, because the Philistines have raided the land. So Saul broke off his pursuit of land. Oh, sorry, he broke off his pursuit of David and went to engage the Philistines. Therefore, that place was named the Rock of Separation. From there David went up and stayed in the strongholds of Engi. Okay, lots of names, lots of movement. But it's a real story that happened in history of David fleeing for his life from Saul. He's battling doing the Edomite. He's Battling Achitwafel. I think that's a really nice name for your next Staffordshire, the Staffordshire Terrier. I'm joking. So David is a problem. Okay? Let me show you some photos. These photos that I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you five of them, are real photos taken by me while I was in Israel. If we talk about the hill country of Judea, if we talk about the hill country and the mountains of the southern part of Israel, this is what we're talking about. Okay? So, I mean, it's not the most lush land you've ever seen. Well, there's some green, but it's really difficult to see what lies behind the mountains. And there's a lot of passes through the mountains to find your way. Okay? Just 30 minutes south, you'll see this kind of wilderness. Now, that's barren, guys. I don't know about you. Does anyone want to do a December holiday there? Okay? There's not a lot going on. So all of these places that was just mentioned in this story, is uh, written or happened in that context. That's where it took place. Lots of heat, lots of exposure, lots of danger, and not a lot of water, and not a lot of resting place. Let me show you another photo. In these hills, this is Bethlehem, modern day Bethlehem in Israel, so you can see it's hilly, it's rocky, it's a little bit more green, but this is where David herded sheep as a young boy. So he knew all about, I have to take the sheep 
over this hill, through the right path to get to the water that's on that side. The sheep know nothing about it, but I do, and therefore I have to shepherd them to that specific place. Right? It's not a place that's teeming with life and water and just lush, green and it's rocky. It's hilly. Let me show you the next photo. These are caves in these mountains where people hid. Because, I mean, where should you stay? Think about that wilderness photo that I just showed you. If you have this plain of wilderness in front of you, and you have to sleep safe tonight, where do you going to sleep? So everywhere in the Old Testament, specifically in the history of the kings, when you read about they hid in caves, or they went around the cave, or they found someone in the cave, there's caves. Can you see how high up it is on the mountains? Because the further you are up, the further you can see. And the further you can see, the more you can know if danger is approaching. But this is where it all took place, guys. I mean, I read the story in two and a half minutes. These were days and weeks of history that played off in this specific area. And then last photo that I want to show you is an actual, real jungle. Now, I know if you live on a continent that sports the big five, and I say wild animal, you don't necessarily think of a jackal, but that's a wild animal. And this photo was taken by us on a hike in the wilderness, like 500 meters from our hotel. Right? So it's still there today. So there were a lot more wild animals in that area in this time. Okay, now let's get back to the song. Think about how vivid these images are. If you are running away from someone who wants to kill you, you don't know where you're going, you don't know where your next meal will come from, but you need to find surety and trust in something. And then you sit down and you write a song like this. Isn't it just phenomenal? That's where this song was born. Now, the song says that I'll find abundance. I'll show you a photo of that now. The song says that he sets a table for me. The song says I have all I need. But what I want you to see is traveling in these circumstances does make one weary. Guys, living life in 2022 makes us weary. Right? It's not easy. It wasn't easy for David. It's not easy for us. But in those circumstances, when it wasn't easy for David, he knew something about God. He confessed something about God that kept him going. Now, a shepherd is sure to lead his sheep to places of renewal. At the end of 1 Samuel chapter 23, it says... From there, David went up and stayed in the strongholds of En Gedi. Can I show you a photo of En Gedi? I was there. Look at this. Palm trees, an oasis, shade, water, and caves. In the middle of nowhere. Guys, it's the weirdest thing. Like you're on the tour bus with the AC on, and then the tour guide says, Right around this corner, we will find the historical site in Gedi. And you can't see it. It's barren, barren land. It is piping hot outside. And then all of a sudden, you make one turn. And there's an oasis for you. This is where David ended up at the end of the story. His shepherd taking him to green pastures. Where he can lie down. Where he can be renewed. For the sake of his shepherd's name. Does it help you guys to get some photos? Right? And to have a picture for where all of this came from. Obviously, if you just think about all the pictures that I showed you up until this point, I think for now you can take down the pictures, please. Remember. For uh, all the pictures that I showed you up until this point, there's a lot of wrong turns. There's a lot of dangerous paths you can take. Just think about having to navigate those in your country. The story that I read to you, it said Saul went around this side and David went around this side. And they never even met each other. Because there's so many different paths in that country. Once again, the context of David is, as I'm sitting here, as I'm experiencing these hardships, I know that He will lead me. He will show the way to me. I can't see it now, but He will, because He is a good shepherd. And what I love, just flip back to the song quickly, look at verse 3, the last little line. He renews my life, He leads me along the right paths, look at that. For his name's sake. Have you ever read that in Psalm 23? Like, it feels to me we all know the start and we all know the finish. But we're going to skim over this life. So who's God? God is the one that says, I make, I make a covenant with my people. 
God is the one that says, I'm rich in love and I'm slow to hand. God is the one that says, I'll keep my side of the promise. God is the one that says, I will establish a family and they will bless the rest of the earth through my name. God is the one that said, what I created you, that sin broke, I will fix. So why is he doing what he's doing to David himself? Well, it's for his name's sake. Because God already stated in the Bible who he is, and now he is just being true to his name. He's being true to his character. This is who he is. He's a good shepherd. This is what I know and have done, right? David, his experience, and this is what God does to me. He gives me what I need. See how the whole picture comes together. Can you guys see how David, sat in these circumstances, says, He is exactly what I need now. He is my shepherd. I have what I need because of Him. And in Him, I will put my trust. I don't need to fear because He's here with me. He's got a weapon so that He can take away a wild animals. And He's got a staff. He can lead me and guide me. He literally has everything I need. Do you guys see rod and staff? So the rod is the thing that he pokes wild animals with, that jackal we just saw. And his staff is what he guides with. Now what's amazing about a shepherd, what's amazing about the character of God, is to be a good shepherd, you need to be strict, and you need to be tender. You guys see? You need to be strict, she can't do whatever they want to. But you also need to be tender, you need to hook them back gently when they do go astray. What's amazing about a shepherd is the shepherd is continuously engaged with his sheep. I think the fact that we always have still images of the shepherd and the sheep makes us think that being a shepherd means I'm sitting down and I'm staring at sheep the whole day and then at the end of the day I'll give a little whistle and they'll come back. That's actually not how shepherding works at all. It is a very, very active job. You're continuously counting, you're continuously guiding, you're continuously checking, you're continuously making sure that the sheep, that the sheep is on the right path. Isn't it just beautiful that David describes God, the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, as one who is involved in our lives like that? Can you imagine? While he's running away, while he's baking in the red hot sun, while he's longing for an oasis like in Gedi, he knows that God is right there with him, counting sheep, guiding him, and he's not um, apathetic to what he's going through. He's right there and very involved in it. I want to invite you to read the first four verses slowly again. Not now, but somewhere today, tonight, tomorrow. And just really let this see. Think about the pictures that I showed you. Think about God as a shepherd. Think about how David sat down and confessed the distrust in God in those circumstances. And just think about how awesome it is that God is my shepherd. God is your shepherd. That is our personal shepherd. Let's look at verse 5 to 6 quickly and then we'll jump into the Gospels. So in verses 5 to 6, there's one subject, and that subject is Yahweh. It's God Himself. And verses 5 to 6 describes what He does, how He rolls. It's abundance. It's joy. It's more than enough. Just to make sure that we are still human beings. Let me show you a photo of some food, right? I think that'll get the stomachs going for a Sunday. This is the kind of table I want it to be inclusive, right? So it's not a vegan photo, but it's also not a meat eater's photo. It's a little bit of everyone, okay? There's a lot of food on God's table. That's what He does. He invites us into places of abundance and joy, and He gives us more than enough. And what I want you to see is not the food. What I want you to see is in verse 6, it says, How long this will continue? All the days of my life, as long as I live. Do you guys see that? This kind of love and provision and blessing from God, it is enduring. It is always. It is never ending. It's not momentary. It's not predicated or dependent upon our performance. I often think that we experience something of God's blessing. And then when we do experience God's blessing, we feel like He doesn't owe us anything for the rest of the year because He was really good to us in January. That's not how He rolls. He's a host. He's a father that says, come and sit at my table and eat even in the presence of your enemies. 
What I think David's trying to say in the psalm is, it doesn't matter what's after me, it's not going to stop God's goodness. You guys see that? God's goodness and His blessing and His provision to me is not going to stop because something or someone wants me or is after me. It's going to continue. In that situation, guys, if we get up every morning this year and we confess that we have what we need, in the midst of many other things we might experience, we will experience that that is not going to stop. And that it's not dependent on anything else than God's goodness and His choice to bless us, to give His protection to us, to have intimacy with us, and to have communion with us. That's Psalm 23, verses 1 to 6. Are you guys still tracking? There's a lot there, right? We can go a lot deeper. I'm not going to go deeper now. I just want us to jump to the gospel. Because Jesus gets described in the Gospels as the good shepherd. Now think about this. We have Gospel writers. We have people writing down the story of Jesus. We call them evangelists. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And for them, when they studied the life of Jesus, it was really easy for them to make the link back to the Old Testament shepherd, knowing that what this person is doing now is perfectly consistent with what the shepherd did in the Old Testament. Therefore, this person has to be God because this person has to be the God of the Old Testament that gets described as a shepherd. Think about it. Jesus feeds 5,000 people. We see it in Mark, we see it in Matthew, Mark 6, Matthew 14, Luke 9, and John 6. In all four Gospels, the story gets recorded. Well, it, it is a story about what? About provision. You need something, I have it. And I'm going to give you more than you can eat. Thousands of people, baskets left afterwards. This is what the God of the Old Testament promised He will do. This is what Jesus Christ is doing at the moment. Therefore, Jesus Christ must be God. It was an easy link for them to make. Because they knew that God is described as the shepherd of His people. Think about Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. It's a very, very uh, well-known portion of Scripture in which Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary, heavy burdened, heavy laden, burnt out of religion, Come to me, and I will give you a real rest. He, he, he makes me lie down. So let me just turn this back. He leads me along the right paths. He leads me beside quiet waters. Oh, okay. So that's what the God of the Old Testament said he'll do. This is what Jesus said he wants to do. Therefore, the God of the Old Testament and Jesus should be the same person. Jesus himself describes his character and the nature of God in his parables as a shepherd. Think of Luke 15. The parable of the lost sheep. He gets the sky as someone that will not rest until I find the lost sheep. It's how it is. Very strict. They all need to be in order. But very tender. I love the individual so much that I will leave the rest and go and look for it. And then obviously we get Jesus Christ himself. Brilliant in John 10. Picking up this metaphor and saying this is is who I am. Elaborating on what a shepherd does and elaborating on what it means for his people. Okay, so think about this rich history. We read the psalm that's consistent with God's character as it gets described in the Old Testament. The psalm was used century after century after century after century by God's people. It's always called people into trust. It's always described why people should trust him. And it's always said that this is who God is and this is what he wants to do. And now Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Let's read. It's going to be a longish portion of scripture, but I think it's worthwhile for us to read it this morning. So I'm going to read John 10 from verses 1 to 18. You'll see it on the board. And we'll see Jesus just being absolutely brilliant in picking up this metaphor that's well known to people so that he can describe to them who he is. Okay, so verses 1 to 18. Let's go. Truly I tell you, Anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. 
Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Okay. So Jesus gives them a quick six verse lesson in what shepherding means. Okay, so he's just describing. Think about it, guys. This is how it works. Okay, I'll check this out. Jesus said again, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So if you want to come in and you want to be protected and you want to be cared for, I am the gate. So that's the first thing that Jesus says. Verse 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Powerful stuff. You guys remember how sheep and shepherding works? Yep. Do you want to be in? Yes, I do. It's through me. And let me tell you what you'll find if you come in through me. Let me tell you what you'll find if you're one of my sheep. You'll find life and life in abundance. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The higher hand, since he's not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. Maybe we can say what I showed you in the photo is a wolf and not a jackal. Okay. This happens because he is a higher hand and doesn't care about the sheep. I don't roll like that. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from the sheep then, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. You've been praying this prayer, Jesus says, for a very long time. It's part of your songbook. You probably know it off by heart. I am the good shepherd. What you've been praying for, what you put your trust in, what you've been longing for, everything you need is to be found in me. And look again at the personal nature. I know them. They know me. I know their voice. They know my voice. I'll keep them safe. With this comes a promise, and that promise is life in the Bible. Jesus goes to great lengths to describe what kind of shepherd he is. And once again, the kind of shepherd he describes himself as links back to the host in verses 5 to 6 and links back to what a father does at home. A good and benevolent host of his children. Look at this uh, quote from Margaret Feinberg. She's a really cool writer. And she wrote a book called Scouting the Divine. I search for God in wine, wool, and wild honey. So what she did is she tried to understand all these agrarian metaphors of uh, people farming you know, and doing stuff with animals and to see what it might have meant in the New Testament. And here's what she said. She said, Shepherds often slept across the openings of their homemade sheep folds, guarding the animals from predators and thieves with their own bodies. Isn't that just beautiful? When Jesus describes himself as the door of the sheepfold in John 10 9, he's painting a rich portrait of being both protector and provider. This is who Jesus is. I don't have to tell you. You can just read it for yourself. But I can tell you from experience that this is exactly what He does. He keeps us safe. He saves us. He protects us. And He does provide for us in a way that a good shepherd does. Now we have a lot of imagination that you need to do here. Okay? Because I know that the good and benevolent host is not necessarily something we all know. I know the good father that as you sat at this table that gives you everything you need is not necessarily a common experience for people in South Africa. But just because we didn't have earthly fathers who cared for us in this way doesn't mean that God can't do it for us. It just means that we have to be open to imagine what this might be like. Because we need to see a good, loving and gracious father who will put his own body on the line for us if we really want to understand what God as a shepherd means to us. Think about this beautiful truth in evangelistic conversation. You're going to have a chat with someone this week. 
you're going to have a chat about economy and work and stress and unrest and politics and all of those things that might discourage and depress us. In that conversation, what if you float this one? You know what? I believe that I have what I need in this context because I have a good shepherd. I believe in Jesus. And uh, because I believe in Jesus, uh, he treats me like a good shepherd does. And he gives me everything I need. So even though we are in these crazy circumstances and we have so many things that we can, can complain and moan about, I look at it differently. I believe that I have everything I need. And if you don't know Jesus, you can actually know him. And you can also have the same posture of trust. Isn't that just a phenomenal way to swing a conversation into evangelism? And you don't even have to have an argument about it. It's just a witness. Because the psalm starts with a witness. Do you guys remember? Confession witness, confession witness. I'm telling you how it is with me. And we can witness about God and His provision in this time and in this way. I started with the question, what does the Lord mean to us in times of disappointment, pain, loneliness, illness, anxiety, fear, temptation, and doubt? This psalm says that in those times He will save me, He will provide for me, He will guide me, He will lavish me, and He will be with me. And we, His children, are at home and in His house forever. What if we start every day with this truth? What if we decide that in 2022, when we get up in the morning, we are going to start with, the Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. And we're going to start with uh, approaching Jesus as the good shepherd who gives us life and life in abundance. What if we start every day with, I know Him and He knows me. What if we start every day with, He has shown His goodness to me and He will do it again. What if we just stop before we start this year and we think about this text. We pray that it will become true in our lives and then we go and live our everyday lives. I think we will have a different year. I think we'll have a different perspective. And I think we'll be sustained. Not, not I think. I know that we will be sustained through anything this year can fall.